trigger and the mind is on the plan. I got my prescription and every citizen's got his. Now join me in the Rubicon and paddle me to France. The nectarine is sweeter there and we... Greetings my chess friends and welcome to this chess video. And the subject of our little video is pawn cover in front of the king. Now we've already seen in previous videos the danger of leaving the king in the centre of the board. And therefore after castling both players tend to simply develop their pieces and begin some type of attack. And more often or not it's attack against the enemy king. Now the pawn arrangement around the king you can see here and here is of great strategic importance. Because simply put, even one little pawn move can throw into question or doubt all of your ideas and plans and can influence the course of the game. So therefore it's very important that we know about the different pros and cons of the various configurations of the king's pawn cover as well as about tactical ideas and threats and combinational tools that we can use against this pawn cover. So if you like attacking play, if you like to attack the king, then I'm sure you will enjoy the little chess lecture that follows. Now the pawns here are in their original positions and this is considered best. Simply put, the pawns control all of the squares in front of the king. And this makes it more difficult for the attacker to exchange off pawns and break open lines for his heavy pieces like the queen and the rook. However, this arrangement of pawns is not without its drawbacks. For sometimes this pawn here can be the object of attack, some sacrificial attack, or sometimes if we take these rooks off, it can be susceptible to back rank mate. So this configuration of pawns is considered best, but it's Good to note that, of course, with all pawn configurations, it's not without its drawbacks. Now, the advance of any one of these pawns usually weakens the castled position. And since the pawns cannot move back, of course, this weakness is irreparable and long-lasting. For example, if we move simply this pawn forward here, we can see that on the plus, it gives black, of course, a square for his king, which saves against something like back rank mate. But the advancement of this pawn here can also provide a target. For example, some sacrificial combination and this severely weakens uh, the position of the king. So once again we can see it has pros and cons and it's good to take this into consideration when we are of course evaluating the position and formulating our strategy. Sometimes we need to move in this example the g-pawn for example either to Fianchetto a bishop or to take action against some type of attack. And here we can see that we have weakened these squares here and they can be used sometimes for an attack against the castled king. However, it's not usually a problem if we have, as we have said, a fianchettled bishop because this takes care of these weaknesses. And it's often the case that our opponent will strive somehow 
to exchange off this fee and chattel bishop so as to take advantages of these weakened squares. Sometimes what happens is the f pawn gets pushed forward. And what it does is it creates a weakness, specifically on the e3 square, but also along this diagonal here, g1, a7 diagonal. And this, of course, is a drawback to this formation in front of the king. The good side is, is that in the end game the king can come into the center quickly via this way here. So again this highlights one of the pros but of course with every pawn configuration there are also a downside as we have highlighted. Now there are instances where two pawns are advanced and this creates a whole complex of weaknesses around the king as you can see here and these squares especially these provide excellent outposts for enemy pieces sometimes like this and both diagonals this diagonal here of course this diagonal here this diagonal here are especially weak Sometimes there are doubled pawns, and you can see that in this instance here. In the first instance, the weakness, of course, is the H file here. And if I can just move this pawn over here and here, and in this instance, the weakness, of course, is this diagonal here, and of course, an open file along the F file. Sometimes the position can result, especially after an exchange on G2 or H2 in this instance, in doubled isolated pawns. And this is especially unpleasant for the defending side. Simply put, pawns are not only weak in themselves, but in addition to these weaknesses, there is of course in this instance an open G file. Sometimes it can be an advantage though, especially if you can get your king here and you can bring one of your own rooks here. And especially if black is castled on this side, you can utilise this open G file. So again we can see the pros and cons in these types of doubled isolated pawns. And finally we come to the position where the pawn cover in front of the king forms a pawn chain. And this itself is considered fairly weak simply because this complex of squares can provide excellent posts for an enemy piece and in addition to that these diagonals here are especially weak. And not only that in addition to this, the second rank in this instance is susceptible to weakness as well. Now certainly the configuration of the king's pawn cover is one of the main factors that we should take into account when we are considering our offensive strategy. And it's very important in view of handling our attacking pieces, which of them we should exchange, which of them we should leave on, what constitutes possible outposts, etc, etc. And then we're going to look at some of the first steps we can take by looking at the most frequent attacking tools against various pawn formations that we have discovered, discussed so far. And generally there are two strategies. We will either try to destroy the pawn cover in front of the king or we will try to provoke weaknesses which we can then utilise. Now in this position here, we can see the pawn cover. This pawn has advanced. 
Therefore, one of the tools that we can use is what is known as a pawn storm. We essentially push our pawns forward in the hope of creating weaknesses in the pawn formation in front of the enemy king. And in this instance, we can simply do that with the move b5. Of course, we're threatening to swap off this pawn. And if the pawn takes, well, again, we are simply intent on creating weaknesses in the enemy position. And all sorts of nasty things can happen. So this is one of the tools we use, the pawn storm. Another typical idea that we use is the peace sacrifice, where we use a piece to destroy the pawn cover in front of the enemy king. And here's a very simplified version of that. Of course, bishop takes h7. King takes h7. We have, of course, ideas like this. And once the king goes back, we have this. So we see the peace sacrifice is an excellent way of destroying the pawn cover in front of an enemy king. But it takes some bravery and a good head for uh, tactics. And you need to be accurate when you're doing it because sometimes the peace sacrifice will not be accepted and you'll find yourself in some trouble. But it's an excellent way to destroy the pawn cover in front of an enemy king. Sometimes it, we need to try to provoke or create weaknesses in the pawn structure around our opponent's king. And we do this to weaken, of course, certain diagonals, to create weak squares, double pawns. All these serve the purpose of weakening the configuration in front of the pawn king. And in this instance, you can see this happening. Now, this is typical of a position from the Sicilian dragon in which black will make an exchange sacrifice in order to create weakness around white's king. And you can immediately see that this square has become weak and white black can use it rather. And of course this square makes an excellent outpost for the knight. So we can see the effect on the pawn cover by a simple exchange sacrifice. In this schematic example we can see that white is essentially forced to weaken the pawn cover in front of his king because of the mate threat on h2 he's forced to advance the g-pawn. And here black can use the idea of undermining in order to weaken this structure further by playing the move h4, trying to undermine and weaken the structure in front of white's king. And finally here is a very another very simple example where white uses undermining to provoke a weakness. Of course is threatening checkmate on g7. Black is forced to advance the pawn. Of course, mate is inevitable anyhow. So these are some very, very simple schematic examples of how we can destroy the pawn cover, how we can try to double the pawn cover in front of the crane, opening up lines, opening up diagonals, creating weakness. Now let's look at how these ideas are actually applied in practice. And I provide one of my own games I recently played on a chess correspondence site uh, in order to demonstrate these ideas. Okay, here's my game. I played someone called Big Troublemaker. And I opened with d4. Knight g2, f6, f3, he played e6, I played e3, c5, 
bishop d3, b6, knight b to d2, bishop came to b7, I castled, and here he played bishop to e7. He's delaying the deployment of the queen's knight. Why? I don't really know. Perhaps because it blocks this diagonal here. And he thought that I might have an easier time getting in the move e4. But I don't know. Anyhow, I played c3. He castled. Queen to e2. Queen came to e7. And I played e4 anyway. And my idea is simply to play e5. And try to disrupt the placement of this knight. Because it guards some important squares. Around the enemy king. Well, d6 was played. Perhaps trying to inhibit this idea. I prepared my idea with rook to e1. The knight came to d7, again trying to inhibit the idea, but I simply played it anyway. d takes e5, d takes e5, and the knight was forced to move. And we have in this position what is known as a pawn nail. This pawn here, supported by Rook and Queen. And it essentially it splits the chessboard in two. And you can see the lack of pieces on Black's king side. The knight that was protecting so many vulnerable squares has been forced to move. And here we can be begin to create weaknesses against the pawn cover of the opponent's king. And I simply do this with a very simple queen to e4, threatening of course checkmate, and forcing black to create some type of weakness in the pawn configuration around his king. And he does this with the move g6. Of course there's a nasty pin along here waiting for my queen, so I simply queen, queen to g4. Rook to e8 was played. And I played knight to f1, not only bringing another priest closer to the king side, but gaining more mobility for my queen's bishop. A5, H4, using the idea of undermining that we discussed earlier. I'm planning, of course, H5 and trying to create weaknesses in this structure here. Well, my opponent, he tried to swap off my light squared bishop, but I'm particularly fond of this bishop, so I simply retreated it to c2. And the bishop came to f8 where it's coming of course to g7 to shore up the weaknesses that has been created by the advancement of the g-pawn. Well I carried out my idea, h5, bishop came to g7 and I played h takes g6, h takes g6 and there is now, of course, an open H file. Bishop to F4. And here my opponent played Knight to F8. I think he's trying to shore up this weakness here, but I'm not entirely sure. I brought my rook into the game. 
and the bishop went back to b7. Here I understood that if I want to have any influence, I need to preserve my dark square bishop, and I need to get rid of this dark square bishop in order to take advantages of the weakness created by the advancement of the g-pawn. Therefore I played bishop to g3. Rook came to d8. And here I played my knight back to d2. The idea is simply to bring my knight here and then into the amazing and excellent outpost on d6. Knight went back to e7, providing mobility for the rook. I carried out my idea of bringing the knight to the outpost. Rook takes. And here I played bishop takes. And here my knight reached the position that it had dreamed of on d6. Bishop came to d5, and of course the bishop has no future on d5. It's not a safe square, and it was forced to retreat back. Here I pin this knight. I think my opponent has ideas of playing f5. And I want to try to prevent that. Rook to d7, and this is essentially a strategical blunder because it allows me to get rid of the g7 bishop. And I immediately do that by forking queen and bishop. Here, Big Troublemaker tried some tricks. And I gleefully chopped off this bishop. King takes. And the bishop comes to f6. And I simply not only threaten checkmate, but I threaten to take a piece as well. Of course my opponent has to do something about this. And... Knight comes to h7. Well, I simply win a piece. And my bishop curtails the mobility of this rook and takes up a position on the outpost on d6. Queen went to c8. And here we take advantage of the weakened squares around the enemy king. These squares here. Queen came to e8. Which was unfortunate because the rook is now pinned. And I simply chop the rook. And after rook to e4, my opponent resigned because there is simply no defence to a move like rook to h4. His down material and his position is not very appealing. Well, we can see how that we made use of undermining by moving the h pawn. And trying to undermine. We made use of tactics when we moved our queen up to e4. Along with the bishop that was on d3. Threatening checkmate and forced our opponent to weaken the pawn formation in front of his king. And all these are very, very simple ideas in themselves. But when you put them together, they are very effective. 
in helping us find strategical ideas and how to undermine the pawn cover in front of an enemy king. So that concludes our little video, my chess friends. I sincerely hope that you get something from it and that you can apply these principles and ideas in your own games. And I wish you well with your own chess.